To our live ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. It is a huge honour to give this the first Steve Hewlett Memorial Lecture, to do it in front of Rachel, to do it in front of Freddie and Billy and Bertie, to do it in front of, I know, other members of Steve's family who are here today. But it is most of all an honour to be talking in front of the big man himself. Trust in the UK media is down by 7% in the latest data from the Reuters Digital News report. Way ahead, let's say, of the United States, but still down and below lots of countries in Europe. And in one YouGov survey a few years back, Wikipedia entries were judged to be marginally more trusted than the BBC. Well, the problem, I think, is this. The decline in trust is due to two main factors. The increased polarisation of our society and our national debate on the one hand, and the increased use, particularly by the most committed of the most partisan, of social media and alternatives to what they call MSM, the mainstream media. Our critics now see their attacks as crucial to their political strategy. In order to succeed, they need to convince people not to believe the news. The former Culture Secretary, John Whittingdale, warned a few months back that we at the BBC would face sanctions, we would face fines from Ofcom unless we ended what he alleged was our anti-Brexit bias. My response to him, my response to the others who complain about who we interview, is the same. I tweeted back in March, and I shall have it put on my grave. Do not adjust your set. Normal service from the BBC means you will hear people you disagree with saying things you don't like. That is our job. Now, it's also become fashionable to argue that one of the reasons the media failed to spot political movements like the rise of Corbyn, Brexit, Trump, is because journalists are, to quote, too far removed from those they report on. Those were Jon Snow's words in his McTaggart lecture, McTaggart lecture when he argued that the media was comfortably with the elite. And once again, when I was thinking about this, I think back to my experience with Steve. We first met, I alluded to it, on a current affairs programme called Brass Tax, based in Manchester. In Manchester, ladies and gentlemen. Note that, not in London. I was from the area, he'd been a student there. We had a different perspective from the people down south. And our team included a former merchant seaman with a broad scouse accent I could scarcely understand and arms covered in tattoos. And yet I've not worked with a single person like him since I got a proper job in television. Why not? I suspect the biggest cause of viewers and listeners feeling that any broadcaster is biased is their sense that they're not hearing people like themselves. How do we? broadcast the best obtainable version of the truth. We should be much more open, we should be much more explicit about what we know and what we don't, how and why we do what we are doing. My bosses may not thank me for this, they may even fear that it will produce yet more complaints, but I urge them to widen this approach further by, for example, translating the new set of producer guidelines, if you know the BBC you'll know that's the Bible of editorial standards, into fluent human that can be tweeted or blogged and broadcast. It doesn't really matter which. Not weeks afterwards in response to a complaint, but as stories happen. In a world, ladies and gentlemen, which there is ever more information, but it gets ever harder to reach the people you want to reach, our challenge is to engage people we once took for granted. It is that mission which, along with the Steve Hewlett Scholarship, would be a fitting and proper testimony to Steve Hewlett. Thank you.